There's what I see at night. I look up there and I can see these constellations. But when this polar axis shift occurs, I got to put it down a little more. So I see this. It says when I see the sky rose. Now what I saw before, I don't see. What I saw before was over here. It's good to see everyone. I think you're going to learn a lot today, and I think it's going to excite you. I know it's excited me. Um, my life is different as a result of studying eschatology. I hope your life will be different. If it's not, you need to really delve into eschatology and also about heaven. The Bible tells us to keep our sights on heaven, and the reason it does is because that keeps our perspective on life uh, the way it should be. We don't get things out of priority or get uh, misplaced priorities, but everything stays in the right order. And that's one of the things that uh, I encourage people to do when they study eschatology is uh, set your sights on Jesus because I promise you it'll change your life. Anyways, for the last month or so, we've been going through the Olivet Discourse verse by verse. And as most of you know, the Olivet Discourse is what Jesus taught concerning the end times. In fact, that's the name of the series, the end times according to Jesus. Now, because we've been going through the Olivet Discourse verse by verse, you should be very familiar with the way it's laid out especially the account recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, because that's the gospel we've stayed in except for one Sunday. Now, let me just kind of go through the way that it's laid out to help you see the overall picture. Matthew chapters 21, 22, and 23 provide the historical setting for the Olivet Discourse. And it begins with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on April the 6th, 32 AD, to officially present himself as the Messiah just as Daniel predicted in his famous 70-week prophecy. This proved beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus was and is the Messiah. But the religious leaders rejected Jesus as their Messiah. But even worse, they used their influence to turn the whole nation against him. Therefore, Jesus not only denounced the religious leaders, but he also explained the consequences of their actions. First, Jerusalem, the temple, would be destroyed and left desolate. Secondly, the Jews would be scattered all over the world. And last but not least, the kingdom of God would be taken from Israel and given unto the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled. Now, this was very difficult for the disciples to fathom. In fact, it blew their mind. So as they were leaving the temple mount, they pointed at the temple and all the buildings surrounded it. And in essence, this is what they said to Jesus. You're telling us that all of this is going to be destroyed and left desolate. To which Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Excuse me. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. That's Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Now, this raised all kinds of questions. So four of Jesus' disciples approached him on the top of the Mount of Olives, and they asked him three questions. Number one. When will the end times begin and what will be the sign that signals that it's begun? Number two, when will Jerusalem and the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign that it's about to occur or happen? And last but not least, number three, when will you return and what will be the sign of your coming? Now, that's not the order in which the disciples asked their questions, but it's the order in which Jesus answered them. Now, in verses 4 through 8 of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus answered the question, When will the end times begin and what will be the sign signaling that it's begun? In other words, what's the sign that lets us know that we're living in the end times? You know what really irritates me as a pastor? You can, I, I can't show it because it comes across as judgmental. But what really irritates me is to hear Christians say, I think we're living in the end times. Or we just might be living in the end times. Because as a pastor, I want to say, what do you mean you think? You should know. That's one of the questions the disciples asked. When will the end times begin? And what's the sign to let us know that it's begun? And yet the church is so ignorant, we don't have the answer to that. So we look at all these things that are happening, and we go, I think we're living in the end times. Well, people, according to Jesus, we're living in the end times. Because the sign is a world war. 
Most people miss that because of the way it's stated. You see, instead of using the term a world war, Jesus used a Hebrew idiom that refers to a world war. He said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That is a Hebraism that means a world war. So that's the sign, a world war. Now, what's interesting is that there has never been a war that involved every part of the world until World War I. People, that's why it was called World War I. And most historians agree that World War II is just a, was just a continuation of World War I. Jesus also said that an increase in the magnitude and scale of earthquake, quakes, and famine would confirm the sign. And people, that's exactly what happened. Since World War I, both earthquakes and famine have increased dramatically, both in magnitude and frequency. Jesus then answered the question, when will Jerusalem and the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign that it's about to occur? Now, Matthew didn't record Jesus' response to this question, but Luke did. And it's found in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through, 20 through 24. That's the one Sunday that we took a break. We stopped looking in Matthew. We went to Luke. Then we came back. But it's recorded in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you'll know that Jerusalem and the temple are about to be destroyed. That's the sign. So flee the city and get out of Judea. And that's exactly what they did. Supposedly not one Jewish believer died because they obeyed the words of Jesus. But that's also what caused the split between Christianity and Judaism. You see, up until that time, even Jews looked at Christianity as just a different sect of Judaism. Some that believed the Messiah had come. But what caused the animosity is that Christian Jews obeyed Jesus' words when they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When they pulled back temporarily, they got out of Dodge. And the other Jews who weren't believers... They saw them as traitors because they left and they didn't help fight. And as a result of that, that created a rift that was never repaired. Everyone with me? Now, in verses 9 through 28, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus explained what's going to happen during that seven-year period known as the tribulation. And he broke this section into two parts. The events of the first half of the tribulation are recorded in verses 9 through 14, and the events of the second half of the tribulation are recorded in verses 15 through 28. So, up to this point, Jesus has answered two of the three questions. And in verses 29 and 30, he answers the last question, which is, when will you return, and what's the sign that it's about to take place? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. When will Jesus return? And what's the sign that signals his return? So turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Follow along as I read verses 29 through 30. And let me remind you that the rapture and the second coming are two different things. This question has nothing to do with the rapture. The rapture comes as a thief in the night. You don't know when it's coming. There is no sign to let you know. But for the second coming, there is. All right, everyone with me? This is verses 29 and 30. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, let me make a brief comment before we start looking at this. As great as the rapture will be, it will be nothing like the second coming. You see, when the rapture occurs, people are here one moment and gone the next. And it happens so quickly, the human eye cannot discern the movement. I mean, you won't even be able to see it. The only thing you'll probably see is the clothes that's left behind, and that's it. But those left behind continue on as if nothing has happened. Now, they're left wondering, how did they disappear? Why did they disappear? What happened to them? Where did they go? They were here just a moment ago, and then all of a sudden they were gone. 
But besides their disappearance, there's nothing dramatic or climactic about it. We just hear one moment and gone the next, caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds. Now, yes, there's going to be mass confusion and horrible accidents as a result of people being raptured who were driving cars or flying planes or operating heavy equipment, but that will only add more mystery to this mysterious event. But my point is this, when it happens, it's over and life continues on, at least for another seven years. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 2 says that it will come like a thief in the night. I keep saying that, and I'm kind of curious as to why no one's asked me, where's the reference to that? It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 2. It says that when the rapture occurs, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. No one will see it happen, but all over the world... Christians will suddenly disappear from the earth as if they were stolen from the earth. But not so with the return of Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus Christ will be the most defining moment and the most climactic event in the history of mankind. It will not only affect every human being on this planet, but every creature on this earth, as well as the chaos. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a chaos. Cosmos. Anyways, now, having said that, let's read verses 29 and 30 again. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. Can't wait to see that happen. I'll be in heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now I want you to notice that Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days. The phrase of those days refers to the 2,520 days of the tribulation. Remember, the first half of the tribulation will last for exactly 1,260 days. The second half of the tribulation will also last for exactly 1,260 days for a total of 2,520 days. If you want to be more specific, it's going to be seven years in prophetical years. What's a prophetical year? A prophetical year is 360 days. So if you take seven years times 360 days, you get exactly 7,520 days. 42 months, or times, time, and a half a time. Yeah. So, according to Jesus, he will return immediately after the tribulation. The word immediately is translated from the Greek word eutheos. And eutheos means without delay or lapse in time. So the phrase immediately after means that Jesus will return as soon as the tribulation is over. He will not return before the tribulation is over, and he won't delay his return for several days after the tribulation has run its course. No, the tribulation will last for exactly 2,520 days. No more than 2,520 days. No less than 2,520 days. And immediately after those days... Jesus will return immediately after. But what will it be like on this earth right before he returns? Because if I want to recognize the sign, I want to know what the conditions are on this earth. Well, look back at verse 29 and let's find out. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, as you can see, Jesus is describing the setting for his return. In other words, what is it going to be like on this earth at the very end of the tribulation? What are the conditions? Why? This is kind of interesting. You get to the very end of the tribulation, what's it going to be like? Well, the sun will be darkened. The moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I don't know if anyone's noticed, 
But Jesus has just described in layman's terms the very same, uh, the very same conditions that John described in the book of Revelation. Let me say that again because it's very important. Jesus has just described in layman's terms the very same conditions that John described in the book of Revelation. John goes into more detail than Jesus, but Jesus is describing the very same thing. In fact, if you don't mind, let me elaborate on some of the events that John mentioned in the book of Revelation and how they're going to produce the effects that Jesus is describing. First, Jesus said the sun will be darkened and the moon won't give its light. That's the effect the fifth bow will produce when it's poured out upon the earth. Look at Revelation chapter 16, verse number 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness, and the subjects ground their teeth in anguish. Now, once the kingdom is plunged into darkness, it stays that way until Christ returns. And that's a good thing to remember. Because once the earth is plunged into darkness, the sun remains darkened until Christ returns. And of course, the moon gets its light from the sun. So if the sun is darkened, then the moon can't shine. Everyone with me? So what Jesus is describing is the effect caused by the fifth bow being poured out upon the earth. Secondly, Jesus said that the stars will fall from the sky. And once again, he's describing the cause and effect of the sixth seal being opened in the book of Revelation. In other words, when the sixth seal is opened, a polar axis shift occurs and the stars fall from the sky. Not stars like the sun, but asteroids and meteorites. I'll prove that to you in just a moment. Turn to Revelation chapter 6, verses um, 12 through 17. I'll show you what I'm talking about. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. Now, really, that's not a good translation. We would say it this way. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely fig when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Sorry, I don't eat breakfast before I get up here, but anyways. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man. In other words, everyone hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, let me ask you a question. If you saw these things happening today, what would you think? What would you think? You would think that the, the world was coming to an end. Yeah. And people, that's the whole purpose of this seal. To warn those who are living on the earth that the world is coming to an end. This is a warning that God is getting ready to bring an end to the sinful world and to set up his kingdom upon this earth. But it's not the end yet. In fact, we're just about 21 to 24 months into the tribulation when the sixth seal is opened. But when those on the earth see these things happening, they'll think it's the end of the world. In fact, They'll wish that it was, but it won't be. So let's look at what happens when the sixth seal is opened. Let's look at verse number 12 again. Remember, this is Revelation chapter 6. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So the sixth seal starts with the great earthquake. And I want you to underline that phrase, great earthquake in your Bible. That phrase is translated from the Greek words megas seismos, which literally means huge earthquake. Let me do my Trump, my, my Trump impression. Huge <laughs> earthquake. In fact, our English word mega is transliterated from the Greek word megas, megas and it means huge and our English word, seismo, 
which means earthquake, is transliterated from the Greek word seismos. So this is a mega earthquake, bigger than the earth has ever seen before. It is going to be so big that it's going to cause a polar axis shift, which I'll explain in detail in just a minute, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. This earthquake is going to be so big that it will be felt worldwide. It'll go off the charts on the Richter scale. The tectonic plates will move, triggering more earthquakes and causing volcanoes to erupt and activating previously dormant volcanoes. These volcanoes are going to spew vast quantities of ash, dust, steam, and gases into the sky, causing the sun to be darkened and the moon to appear blood red. But people, that's just the beginning. Look at verse 13, same chapter, Revelation chapter 6. Verse 12, now we're looking at verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now the word stars is translated from the Greek word aster. Our English word asteroid comes from this Greek word. In fact, did you know that asteroids are the source of all meteorites? Or not all, but most meteorites. It's true. So asteroids and meteorites are going to be falling on the earth like fruit falls from a tree on a real windy day. Now, this is the same Greek word that Jesus used when he said in the Olivet Discourse that stars will fall from the sky. He used the Greek word aster. So he's not referring to stars like the sun. He's referring to asteroids, just like John was in the book of Revelation. So I want you to get a picture in your mind of what's going to happen. A huge earthquake occurs, causing the tectonic plates to move, which triggers more earthquakes, which causes volcanoes to erupt, which causes the sun to become dark and the moon to turn red. And then you have huge asteroids falling on the earth, wiping out cities and causing catastrophic damage and destruction to the earth. But people... That's not the worst of it. These catastrophic events will cause a polar axis shift. Now, does everyone know what a polar axis shift is? It doesn't do any good for me to tell you that it's going to cause a polar axis shift if you have no idea what that is. So does everyone know what a polar axis shift is? You do? Most people don't? All right. Let me see if I can explain it to you. The earth is like a gyroscope spinning on an axis. The axis that it's spinning on is called the polar axis because it's in line with the north and south poles. In other words, think of the axis as an imaginary line that extends through the north and south pole. And that's what the earth is spinning on. In fact, I brought this up for you to see. If you notice, every globe looks just like this. It's tilted a little bit. The axis is always running here. It's always running through the North Pole and the South Pole so that it can spin on this axis. So there's this imaginary line that goes through the North Pole, down through the South Pole, and the Earth is tilted at 23.5 degrees. And it spins on that axis. Everyone with me? Yeah. All right. Now, the earth is tilted, as I said, at 23.5 degrees on its axis as it rotates around the sun. That's why we have different seasons throughout the year. As the earth revolves around the sun, the northern and southern hemispheres either move closer to the sun or further away. In fact, let me, let me just show you this because you might not know. Let's suppose that this is the sun and we are thousands of miles, millions of miles or whatever miles away. Now, if you notice, this is the earth and it's going to spin around the sun. If you notice when it's like this, if this is flat, it's tilted 23 half degrees. It's summertime right now for those in the southern atmosphere or southern hemispheres. Why? Because they're closer to the sun. It's wintertime for all those in the northern hemisphere. Why? Because they're further away from the sun. Now, we know that the earth revolves around the sun. It revolves How? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Good job, counterclockwise. So I should go this way, but I'm not going to go this way because I want you to see. So now we're looking at the northern hemisphere, and at this point, it's in the wintertime. The southern hemisphere is in, is in summertime. When it revolves around the sun in six months over here, now all of a sudden we have something different. 
that in the northern hemisphere is closer to the sun and that in the sun, southern hemisphere is further away from the sun. So in the southern hemisphere, they're experiencing winter. We're experiencing summer. That's why we have our seasons because the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. So when it revolves around the sun, we go from winter to summer. And of course, we have those seasons in between because it's slowly changing. And our favorite time of year is what? The fall. Because it's football season. Yeah. Now, the polar axis of the earth is pointed towards the North Star. Does everyone get that? This axis that's running through here, if you took this imaginary line, this axis points where? To the North Star. And it continues to point towards the North Star as it revolves around the sun. Again, that's why we have different seasons. It's because it doesn't wobble as it revolves around. It continues to be pointed towards the North Star at all times. Now, how many of you remember the tsunami that hit Sri Lanka on December 26, 2004? I know it was a long time ago, 2004. But how many of you remember that? I think they even made a movie about that. It was a fictitious movie, but it was based on it. It was caused by a massive earthquake that measured a nine on the Richter scale. 170,000 people were killed in Sumatra, 31,000 in Sri Lanka. What's interesting is that earthquake that triggered that tsunami was said to have caused the earth to wobble. Not enough to feel, but enough to measure. Now, when I say wobble, I'm talking about the polar axis moving from its tilt of 23.5 degrees. So when this earthquake happened and it caused this tsunami, we're tilted at 23 and a half degrees. It caused the earth to wobble a little bit. Did you know that? Not enough for us to feel, but enough for us to measure. Yeah. Now, when I say wobble, I'm talking about the polar axis moving from its tilt to 23.5 degrees. And that's what a polar axis shift is. It's when the polar axis shifts. And the earth is either tilted more than 23.5 degrees or less than 23.5 degrees. Now, can you imagine what that would do? It would create a dramatic climate change, to say the least. It would literally turn the world upside down. So all you climate changers, good Lord. Well, you don't believe science, Pastor Al? Of course I believe science. Let me tell you, the earth has always changed its climate, but you hadn't seen true climate change until this takes place. I'll go a little bit further. Well, the science says all of the science is being conducted by research universities. In fact, how many of you watch Big Bang Theory? Have you noticed that those on Big Bang Theory never teach? You want to know why they don't teach? They're research professors at these universities, so they don't teach, they do research. And in order to be able to do the research, they have to get grants. So they get this grant money in order to do this research. But if they disprove what they're researching, then the money dries up and goes away. So guess what? You can't disprove it, people. You might change it and then go a different way, but you gotta keep it coming. Let me just give you a little saying to help you out with this world. Figures don't lie, but liars figure. Who you want actually reading the research are those who don't have grant money tied to it. Yeah. I'm oh, worried about climate change, climate change. Let me tell you, climate change is coming. It's coming in the last seven years, and we're living in the end times. I think it's going to come in the next 15 to 20 years when we're out of here, and seven years comes, and we're about 21 to 24 months, and the sixth cell happens. You're going to see true climate change when the earth begins to wobble. When that polar axis shifts. Now, how do I know that a polar axis shift is going to occur when this great earthquake hits? Well, look at verse number 14. Revelation chapter 6. We're still reading about the sixth seal. Look at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, that's really not a good translation. Let me show you why I say that. 
First of all, the word departed is translated from the Greek word apokorizo, and it means to split or to part. So what John was saying is that heaven was split like a scroll. So I want you to picture heaven as a scroll. Now look back at verse number 14. I want you to underline the phrase, rode together. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rode together. Underline that phrase, rode together. That phrase is translated from the Greek word, hyliso, which simply means to roll. The picture that John is painting is of a scroll that's being rolled. Not rolled up or out or together, but simply being rolled. You're rolling one end out as the other end is being rolled in. Now, let me illustrate what John was saying. He said that heaven, in other words, the sky, was parted like a scroll and rolled. Now, typically, whenever a scroll was rolled, you rolled one side out and the other side in. So let me just kind of show you with this scroll here. It says, heaven is rolled like a scroll. And what that means is, if we hold this up, this is the part of the sky that we see where we're, where, where we're at on the earth. So when we're here in Oklahoma and we look up at the sky, this is what we see. But he tells us when the sixth seal hits, what we see, this sky is going to roll. Do you see it? Doesn't mean one's going to roll all together. It doesn't mean one's going to roll out or this one's going to roll out. It simply says it's going to roll. What you see in the sky will roll. Everyone with me? All right. So that means that the stars that were visible before, wherever you lived, they're no longer visible. Or you have to look somewhere else to see them. Because the sky has been rolled like a scroll. And the stars that weren't visible before are now visible. Why? Because the sky's been rolled. There's what I see at night. I look up there and I can see these constellations. But when this polar axis shift occurs, i got to put it down a little more. So I see this. It says when I see the sky rolls. Now what I saw before, I don't see. What I saw before was over here. What I saw before, I no longer see. And what I couldn't see, I now see. Everyone with me? All right. Now, let me ask you a... Woo! I've been a good rodeoer. Let me ask you a question. What would make the sky seem to roll like a scroll? Only one thing. A polar axis shift. That's the only thing that can explain the sky looking like a parted scroll that's being rolled. Still don't believe it? Look at the last part of verse 14. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now the word moved, kineo, can mean to move or it can mean to remove. But it really doesn't matter because either one describes the effect of a polar axis shift. When the earth's axis shifts, most islands will be wiped away. They'll be covered by water. And the ones that aren't will seem like they've been moved. Those in the tropics will seem like they've been moved. Yeah, they'll seem like they're in the Arctic Circle. And those in the Arctic Circle will become like tropical islands, as if they were moved from one location to another. Now, when the sixth seal is opened and the polar axis shift occurs, it will fulfill several of the prophecies in the book of Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. And all the hosts of heaven, what are the hosts of heaven? Stars. Shall be dissolved. What? Well, just a minute. Let's find out what that Hebrew word means. And all the stars of heaven, host of heaven, shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rowed together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down. As the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Now I want you to underline the word dissolved. Dissolved is translated from the Hebrew word makak, makak, and it means to decay. 
or to rot. Now, when something starts to decay or rot, its cells are actually breaking down. So it is no longer stable. Ever picked up a fruit that's overripe, starting to rot? It's squishy. It's not firm. It's no longer stable. And people, that's what Isaiah is saying. The host of heaven, the stars in the sky, are no longer stable. What does he mean by that? They no longer hold their position. Did they change their position? No. The earth changed. A polar axis shift occurred. So what the stars used to be in the constellation used to be here in the sky. Now they're down here. Yeah. Why? Because the heavens are being rolled together like a scroll. Now I want you to underline this phrase here in Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4. Rolled together. That phrase is translated from the Hebrew word galal. It simply means to roll. So this is the way it should have been translated. And the heavens shall be rolled as a scroll. That's the very same thing that John saw in his vision in the book of Revelation. Exact same thing. Isaiah went into an open-eyed trance. He sees this vision of heaven. He sees what's going to happen in the end times. Boy, 800 years later, John has his revelation. That's what revelation means. It's a vision. He goes into an open-eyed trance. He sees this vision, and guess what? He sees the very same thing that Isaiah does. When the end times comes, the sixth seal is opened. The heavens roll like a scroll. Now look at Isaiah chapter 24, verse 20. Another verse. The earth staggers like a drunk. The earth staggers like a drunk. It trembles like a tent in a storm. How many of you like to camp out? You get your tent out there and a storm comes in with high winds. You think the tent's going to blow over because it's just doing this. It falls and will not rise again. It falls and will not rise again. For the guilt of its rebellion is very heavy. Why is it coming upon them? This is God's judgment. Last seven years of the tribulation. Boom. The great earthquake, volcanoes erupting, and asteroids hitting the earth will cause the earth to stagger as if it's drunk, and then it will fall. In other words, the polar axis will shift. Yeah. It will stagger like a drunk, and then it will fall. Now, if you were on the earth when all this occurred, what would you be thinking? You'd be thinking, this is the end of the world. You'd be scared to death. You'd run from the cities to hide in the hills, and you would be thinking that God's judgment has finally come up on the earth. And people, that's exactly what happens. Look at verses 15 and 16. We're still in Revelation chapter 6, talking about the sixth seal. Here's what it says. Remember, we read this. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Notice that everyone reacts this way. From the kings all the way down to the homeless. Everyone is running to the mountains. These asteroids are hitting. If they land on cities, it's just wiping the entire city out. Don't go to Yellowstone because that's a dormant volcano. And when it goes off, it will affect the entire United States. All of these things are happening. Asteroids are hitting the earth. The earthquakes are going off. Volcanoes are spewing. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? You're going to run to the mountains. Believe it or not, Oklahoma is one of the safest places to be. Did you know that? You might need to worry about that if you're not raptured. All right? But everyone runs to the mountains, and because of fear of what's going to come next, they want to die. It's kind of funny about men. When we're scared to death that we'll die, it's almost as if we want to die, but we don't want to die. 
That's why we're scared to death if we run to the mountain. But you just say, just get it over with. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. It's not the end. It's just the sick seal. And when they finally realize that it's not the end, they harden their hearts like Pharaoh did in Egypt. Instead of repenting and receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord, they harden their heart. Now, some are saved. You still have the two witnesses that are, wit that are going in and, and prophesying in Jerusalem. You still have the 144,000. You have those who were raised in church, thought they were saved, missed the rapture, realized what's going on, and they're getting saved. You know, that's one of the purposes of the tribulation, three purposes of the tribulation. To put an end to wickedness and wicked people, number one. To cause the greatest revival the world's ever seen, number two. But the most important, top priority is number three. To bring Israel as a nation to a saving revelation of Jesus Christ. To recognize that Jesus is the Messiah and they missed him. Because when they repent and beg him to return. Well, anyways, I'm getting it myself. But why has God done this? Why did he set it up for the sixth seal to be this horrible? Because they didn't receive Jesus Christ during the dispensation of grace. Therefore, he's going to bring judgment in the hope that they will repent before the final judgment. My dad used to have a little saying that went like this. Those who don't hear must feel. He said that all the time. He had four boys. When you have four boys, you got to say that. Jack Reese is sitting back here, and I guess he had four girls, maybe. Did you have to say that to girls, too? I don't know. Those who don't hear, must, or those who can't hear, must feel. In other words, if you won't listen, do what I tell you to do, you're going to get spanked, is what my dad was actually saying. Well, those on the earth during the tribulation that don't listen to God, that's why they weren't raptured. Therefore, God's going to bring judgment upon them. He's spanking them, but his whole purpose in spanking them is because he wants them to repent. He wants them to see this happening and for the few to go and the 144,000 to be preaching and the two witnesses to be preaching. This is exactly what the prophet said would happen. Let me just show you in Isaiah 34.4. Let me just show you in Isaiah. Let me just show you what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 24. Let me just show you what John said in Revelation chapter 6. Yeah. But here's what's interesting. What Jesus is describing in the Mount of Olives, or the Olivet Discourse, is the very same thing that John is describing in the book of Revelation. Of course, John goes into much more detail than Jesus does, but Jesus is describing the very same thing. Jesus doesn't need to do another Revelation. The Olivet Discourse doesn't need to be like the book of Revelation. He just needs to tell them, this is what you need to know, and this is how it's going to affect you. But what Jesus is describing are the very same conditions on the earth that John describes when he tells us the sixth seal is opened and the fifth bowl is poured out. Now, these conditions or what it's going to be like at the very end of the tribulation, right before Christ returns. And that's very important because everyone's going to be looking to the sky when Jesus returns because the sun is darkened. The moon does not shine, shine its lights. Asteroids have fallen upon the earth. And my guys, we're watching the sky. And then we get to verse number 30 next week the sign of Jesus Christ coming. Yeah.